Hello, welcome to the session about Deploy R and how to manipulate data with R and R Studio with this particular package, Deploy R. So this is a, an introduction to the package. We'll only go through a few of the functions included in this package. There's a lot more than what we'll see today, but hopefully this gets you started with data manipulation. So what we're gonna have a look at today is this particular package, Deploy R that allows us to explore, filter, reorganize, process our data, our tabular data, and specifically the six verbs or um, six functions that we're gonna look at are filter to pick observations, arrange to reorder rows, select to pick variables, mutate to create new variables, summarize to collapse to a single summary, and group by to change the scope of the functions. So we'll go through each one of them one by one. So hopefully it'll make more sense by the end of this session, by the end of this video. And we will also introduce two important concepts or tools in R, which are logical operators and the pipe operator. So we'll open R Studio. You should have R and R Studio installed on your computer. This is what it looks like on my computer. We've got a new R session on the left here in the console with our prompt waiting for input. Input. On the right, we've got an empty environment. We haven't created any object here. And we've got a help page at the bottom. So I'm gonna go to our project menu. Up in the top right, you can straight away create a new project which is a nice way to have everything contained in one single directory. And I'm gonna go to new directory and new project. So the two top choices in this list. And here we can decide on the name of our project or the name of the directory where everything will happen. This one will be called dplyr underscore intro. I keep all my projects inside a directory called our projects to keep it tidy so it doesn't create it in my home directory by default. And once you're happy with those details, you can click Create Project here. What this does is it restarts R and it moves the working directory, as you can see in the Files pane, to what we just created, dplyr intro. The only file that we can see right now in this directory is dplyrintro.rproj, which is the R project file that you can reopen to go back to your work. We'll make sure that we've got dplyr installed. So if you click on packages here in this tab, you'll find that it lists all the packages you've got on your computer. I already have dplyr, as you can see it here. It's described as a grammar of data manipulation, and this is the version here on the right, 0.8.0.1. Now, if you don't have it already, there's two ways to install the package. You can use the command install.packages with the string dplyr, and this will automatically fetch the package from the official repositories on the CRAN and download it and install it. You can execute that and wait for it for, to finish. You can also go to the graphical user interface and use the install button here to open this dialog and type the package name here. And you can see that it suggests separate packages. dplyr is here. You can select that and click install. The result will be that it will run pretty much the same command as we've got here in our console. So two options here. Make sure you've got this package installed, listed in your user library. Third bit of setting up that we'll do today is create a new script. I'll go to this new file menu here. It's a drop down menu. And the top one, the top choice here is our script. You can use Control Shift N to create a new script too. I'm gonna click here and this opens our fourth division, our fourth panel or pane in our interface. This is the source pane. I can start with describing what this is. So a little description at the top using a hash symbol to start the line. This is to say, this is a comment. You don't need to interpret this. 
free text here description intro to data manipulation with deploy R. Right, so this is our script. You can see that it says untitled one star here in the title of our tab. Let's make sure we save this. So if you click on the floppy disk or you use the shortcut Control S, you can give your file a name. Let's call this one process and click save or press enter. If you check in your files, you should see this new file here, process.r, process.capital R. This is automatically the extension for an R script that was added to our file, our file name. Now we'll import some data to play around with. And to do that, we can use a function that is included in base R called read.csv. And this is our usual data set that we use in our demonstrations. And it will be called or will be saved as an object called gapminder. So starting with the name gapminder, then the assignment operator. You can use alt hyphen for this one, or you can type it smaller than hyphen. And then we'll use read.csv to read a CSV file. So make sure you open those double quotes to provide a path or a URL. And what we're going to use is this URL that is in the video description. It links to a CSV file, as you can see here at the end. So copy that and paste it in here. And that's the only argument that we use in the read.csv function. Now you can execute this with Control Enter. Make sure you remember this shortcut, Control plus Enter, is to execute from the script window of script panel. And it's the same thing as pressing this button here, Run. And you can see that it suggests using the Control plus Enter shortcut. So it has sent the command to our console, you can see it here, executed it, and we end up with an object here in our environment. It's called gapminder. It's got 1704 observations of six variables. So 1704 lines and six variables. And if you want to familiarize yourself with those variables, you can go to the arrow here, click that and see the different names. So we've got country, year, population, continent, life expectancy, and GDP per capita. Now we'll have to use exactly the names of the columns here, of the variables, so we can use them. And you can also see how many levels there are, how many different values there are for the different factors. So that's the strings, like countries and continents. You can also see how data was interpreted for numerical values. We've got some as integers and others as numericals. Another way to familiarize yourself with this data set is to use the summary function, which works with lots of different objects. But if you provide a data frame like this one, gapminder, and execute that, you'll end up with some summary statistics in your console for each one of the variables. And depending on the type of variable, you'll get different results. So for a categorical variable like country, you'll get a count of how many times they appear in the data set. Whereas for a numerical variable like year, you'll get minimum, maximum, quantiles, median and mean. Now we realize that the data starts in 52 and finishes in 2007, for example. Finally, if you want to see your data as a table, or as a spreadsheet. You can click anywhere on this line or you can click on this spreadsheet spreadsheet icon. Click on that and this opens another tab in your source pane and this is your data that you can scroll through, search for a term, 
and you can also use a filter here. Now this is only a viewer. You can see in the console here that the command that was run was capital V view gapminder. So anything that you do here will not modify the data. Now back in our script, we'll make sure that we load the package so we can access the functions. If you look in your packages pane, you'll see that dplyr here is not ticked. But if I run a command library dplyr, no need for double quotes here, you can execute this. It loads the package and now we have access to its functions. Here it is, ticked. And there's some feedback in the console here that says that it's attaching package dplyr, same as loading. And the following objects are masked from package stats. So those two functions, filter and lag, already existed in the stats package that's by default loaded when you start an R session. But know that because you've loaded dplyr afterwards, filter and lag will be by default the ones from the package dplyr. Same thing with the functions intersect, set diff, set equal, and union. There's functions that have the same names in the base package, but from now on, if we use just the name of those functions, it will use the dplyr functions by default. I can demonstrate that. For example, if you do question mark filter and execute that, you'll see that instead of taking you straight to a help page, in the help panel here, it shows you that there's two different options, one from stats and one from dplyr. So let's have a look at our first example. And this one is called filter. I'm going to create a header in our script here. Number one, filter is used to pick observations. Now to create headers in your script, you can use four dashes at the end of a comment or any anything or more than four dashes. And you'll see that here at the bottom of your source pane or script pane, you'll see the title comes up. So that's an easy way to navigate in your script. And our first example, we'll be having a look at how we can restrict our data set to only Australian data. So to do that, we have to introduce logical operators. And what logical operators are, they are binary operators that allow you to check for a condition and they return a Boolean value or logical value, which is either true or false, or most of the time true or false. So for example, if I check that one is equal to one, I can use the double equal, which is the logical operator for equality. If I execute this, you can see in the console that it returns true. One is equal to one. If I do the same thing for one, equal to 2. I can execute that again and it tells me false. So it's kind of a switch. I can use this to take decisions in my programming. There's a few more and the most common ones are inequality. So the opposite of equality is exclamation point and equal. So you can imagine an equal sign crossed by an exclamation point. Is 1 unequal to 3? And this is true. So this is an equal. Now I can also use greater than, smaller than. So 13 is smaller than 14. Execute that, I get true as expected. Is 12 bigger than 12? This is false, and you can also combine the equal sign with those ones. For example, greater or equal to zero. And this is true. So you can play around with those ones. The final one for being thorough here is 12 smaller or equal to 12. 
as you can expect it. This is smaller or equal. And this is true. OK, so let's use this. Yeah. And let's find only Australian data. So we can create a new object called, for example, Australia. Use the, oops, sorry about that, assignment operator. And store in there the result of the filter function working on Gapminder and checking for the condi condition that country is equal to Australia. You can check for strings too. So we want the categorical variable country, which is here, to contain the value Australia. Because it's a string, I need the double quotes here. And if I execute this, I end up with a new object called Australia with only 12 observations of six variables. If I click here on this object, I can visualize that in the viewer. And there's Australia only in our country variable. So this has worked. Again, I mentioned that you can compare strings. So you can say, is this equal to that? That You will say false. And is this equal to this? You will say true. So that's what we did here. For each row in our data set, it has checked for the condition and returned only the true lines. So all the filters that we use today, sorry, all the functions that we use today, have the same structure. First, the first argument is what data we deal with. So we have to start with the data set gap binder and then follow with the conditions or the operations that we apply to that data set. So let's have a look at another example. Only life expectancy higher than 81. Let's have a look at that. We could create a new object called life80 and store in there the result of the filter function working on Gapminder and looking at the life exp variable greater than 80. Control Enter to execute. You end up with a third object in your environment here. Life 80, 21 observations. Sorry, so I use 80 here. I'll amend that. 81, that was my question. Control Enter. This updates the object, Life 80. It still has all the variables, but it only has seven lines. So again, I can click on that and have a look at the seven cases in our data set that have a life expectancy higher than 81. And they end up in Australia, Hong Kong, Iceland, Japan, and Switzerland. And they're all from the 2000s. So let's move on to our second verb. Again, I'll create a header here. Number two is arrange. And this can be used to reorder rows. Let's say we want to have a look at the entries with highest GDP per cap or GDP per capita. I'm going to use a verb called the range, the function arrange, and same as with filter, we have to start with where the data comes from, first argument, and follow with the variable we want to use to order our data, so GDP per cap. If I execute this, I will try to print a lot to the console. And that's not particularly ideal, but if you scroll to the top, you'll see the beginning of our data set, reordered data set. And you can see that it starts with the lowest GDP per capita in the data set and works up from there. Now, if we want to find the highest, we might have to change that. First, to make it a bit more readable, we can use the head function. So it only prints a few, sorry, we'll have to use a range. And inside a range, modifying the Gapminder data set and ordering it by GDP per cap. So same thing as before, 
but we are nesting here this operation with the function arrange inside the head function to only see the top. So that works, only six lines here in our console. But we want to have a look at the highest GDP per cap, so what we can do is go with the descending function here. So descending will reverse the order. We can execute that again and then we end up with only lines from Kuwait up here with a really high GDP per cap here. This is it for this particular verb, deploy our verb. Let's move on to number three and start using select. And this is to pick variables. So if you have a big data set and you only want to pick some of the variables in there, you can restrict it to something smaller like Let's call it this. Let's call this one gap small for small gap minded data set. And store inside it the result of the select, select function working on the gap minder object. And then selecting for the year variable, then the country variable, then GDP per cap. So only three variables here. Originally we've got six, but we want to only keep those ones. Control enter to execute and you end up with gap small here. St same number of observations or rows, but only three variables as you can see here. If I uh, open it with the blue arrow here, I can see that it's ordered as I said it should be, year, country, and then GDP per cap. So you don't have to respect the original order. You can see that in the original one, it starts with country, then goes to year, then goes to con uh, to life to GDP per cap. Sorry, but we can reorder that straight away with a select call too. So what if we want to combine two operations? Let's say we want this gap small data set, but we want it only for the year 1997. So one way to do that is create yet another object, gap underscore small underscore 97, and store inside it the result of a filter function on gap small, checking for the condition that year is equal to the year 1997. So this works perfectly fine. Again, control enter to execute this. I end up with gap small 97 here in my environment. It's got the three variables that we selected, and it's got only 142 observations related to the year 1997. You can confirm that with the viewer. Here it is, year 1997, only year country and GDP per cap. So this is fine, you can do step-by-step -step operations like this, saving intermediate objects. Another way to do this would be to do everything at once and nest operations inside each other. So we're nesting operations inside each other, so we would start outside with the latest operation, so the filter operation, in which we look for the year 1997, but in the first argument we have to provide the data for that, so it has to be already the select function working on the original dataset gapminder, where we only want year country and GDP per cap. This works fine, it's two steps only, but it becomes hard to read because the first step is here inside the select operation and then around it the filter operation. So again we can save this as gap underscore small underscore 97 and if I execute this, there will be no difference with the object we already had. 
you might want to press enter here to go to the next line and organize your arguments more read in a more readable way. If I execute this yeah, same thing here, 142 observations and three variables. Now, there is a third method here. First case, we created intermediate objects. Second case is this case we um, did everything in one line, but it was a bit more hard, a bit harder to read. And finally, what we can do is using the pipe operator. So the pipe operator looks like this. It's a percent sign followed by a greater than followed by another percent. And this can be used to pipe something from the left side into the function to the right side as the first argument. So let's have a look at our example here. Again we start with the final object and store inside it the result of the operation on the right. But what we're going to do here is we start, we start with the dataset gapminder, the original one, and use the pipe operator. So that's greater than, sorry, percent, greater than percent. We can go to the next line and use our select function where we list the variables that we want to keep. That's year, country, and GDP per cap. And again, the pipe operator to finish with a filter function where the year is 1997. Third method, method here, if I execute this, again, same, exactly the same result here. So notice a few things with this. The pipe operator here will take whatever's on the left and send it as the first argument here in the function directly to the right. So we don't have to repeat where the data comes from in our select function or in our filter function because it's already provided by the pipe. We only have to specify what operations we want to do. Keep those variables and select only or filter for the year 1997. The other thing is that we don't have to create intermediate objects, but we still can read the operations logically from left to right. So we can read this as a sentence. We're going to create an object gap small 1997, gap small 97, and it will be the result of the dataset gap minder, then selecting those variables and then filtering for the year 1997. So you can read the operator, the pipe operator, as a then. So this might save you a little bit of typing if you don't create objects all the time or if you don't repeat yourself all the time, but also it will make your code more readable. Imagine that you've got five, six, seven steps in your processing it will be a lot better than having lots of objects or making your code completely unreadable by nesting the functions into each other. So it's a very useful operator, this one. And from now on, we'll keep using this syntax in the next examples. Okay. So just to confirm that this makes sense. Another example of using the pipe, a more simple one, would be to start with gapminder, pipe that into a summary function. So I don't have to specify any argument in my summary function because the pipe will provide that as the first argument here. I can execute that and get the summary. So it's exactly the same as summary with gapminder as the first argument. Same result in the console. Okay. Let's do a little challenge here. So the idea is to create a tiny data set that will have 
the 2002 life expectancy observation for the country Eritrea. So there's three things here, 2002 life expectancy Eritrea. Now if you want to do this challenge you can pause the video now and try it in your own time and I'll straight away give you the answer. So to solve this one I would start with Eritrea underscore 2002, that's the name of our new object to store the result, result in. And using the same syntax as before I'm going to use gapminder to start with and pipe that into a select function selecting for year, country and life exp and then sending that or piping that into a filter function where we want the country to be Eritrea so it has to be the string Eritrea in double quotes for the country variable and the year to be 2002. So this works or not. If I look at the error in the console it says year equals string 2002 must not be named. Alright so there's a couple of uh, issues here and it's good to see those ones because they happen all the time. First issue here is that and there's a hint there. Do you need double equal? Yes that's the case. We don't want to name an argument but we want to check for a condition so year double equal 2002. The other issue and you'll notice the error in a second or actually you can't see it straight away but if I check for... okay so this has still worked for... that's interesting I didn't... I can still use the double quotes here for some reason I don't have to have it without but you, both will work and I didn't know that this um, was allowed but anyway we're using a number so you might as well save yourself some typing and not use the double quotes but now I know that the double quotes also work around the number so there's a little bit of flexibility there in the function. So notice a couple of things we can confirm that this has worked if I look at Eritrea 2002 there's the three variables that we were interested in year, country, life, exp and we wanted for the year 2002 the country Eritrea and this is the life expectancy. So it's a tiny data set, a tiny data frame but that's what we wanted. So a couple of things here, notice that I can check for several conditions in one single filter function. So you can do this, you can also have two separate filter steps. That's perfectly fine but this option here will save you some typing. The other thing is that in our case we could have done the selecting after the filtering if we wanted to. It wouldn't have had any consequences on the result, it would be the exact same thing. In other cases you might have to do something before another step. Alright, so let's move on to the next verb. We're up to three now, selecting variables, uh, we introduced the pipe and the logical operators, now let's move on to 4 with the mutate verb. This one's a really useful one to create new variables. So let's have a look at our data. The original gapminder data set here has a couple of interesting variables that we can reuse. So there's GDP per cap and there's population. So if we multiply those two together we'll end up with the total GDP, gross domestic product, for a country at that time. So to do that we can add an extra variable, an extra column to our data set and store this value. So let's have a look at that. Gap underscore GDP is our new object. We'll keep using the pipe syntax and before I move on I might give you a little tip here another shortcut that makes your life easier. You can use Control plus Shift plus 
M on your keyboard to bring up the pipe operator because it's a bit of a cumbersome one to type. So starting with Gapminder, use your shortcut now, Control shift m We'll pipe that into a mutate function. And in the mutate function we have to define what we are calculating. So we can give it a name like GDP and that's equal to the formula GDP per cap multiplied by pop population. So we're multiplying GDP per cap by population and storing that as a new variable called GDP. If I execute this, I end up with this object called gap underscore GDP here in my environment and it's got not six variables but seven variables. If I open this, I can see here the last column GDP contains those numbers that we just calculated, the total GDP in dollars. Now those numbers are very big, so not very human readable. We might want to divide that to get millions of dollars maybe. So we could modify our code here and add a second argument, a second mutated value here where we want a new variable called GDP mil, for example, that contains the result of GDP divided by 10 to the power of 6. So 10 divided by a million. Sorry, GDP divided by a million. Notice that we can straight away reuse GDP. We created it here, but in the second argument we're already reusing it for another operation. So I can execute this and have a look again at my dataset gap GDP. There's GDP here and there's GDP mil here. If I click on the dataset I can have a look at the numbers and there's our numbers that are a lot more readable than before in millions of dollars. Alright, let's move on to number five. Sorry, I should add the dashes at the end of this header. Now I've got my title here. And number five is the summary function. Oh, sorry, summarize. We've seen summary before. But summarize will collapse to a single summary. Let's see what it can do. Starting with Gapminder, we want to get a summary of the life expectancy variable and we want the mean of the life expectancy. So I can use the function mean and in parentheses yeah, the, the argument that we use is the name of our variable life exp. So if you execute this you end up with a tiny data set, one cell, one column, one row. Mean life expectancy is 59.47 for the whole data set. So that might not be particularly meaningful for across several countries and years. But anyway, this is to demonstrate what Summarize does. It collapses to one single summary depending on what you're giving it. So you can also name, just like we did with Mutate, name the variable that you create, or the summary that you create, and we can call this one mean le. If I execute that again, I end up with, instead of the operation, the name that we've given it. So this is fine for one single summary, but here we want to use another function, the final function today, to change the scope of our operation. So you might want to find the mean life expectancy for different groups. So let's have a look at the verb group underscore by, which is a very powerful one to associate with other functions. And this will help us to change the scope. Let's see what it does first before we associate it with other functions. Starting with Gapminder, we can pipe that into a group by function. And we're going to use the variable continent here. If I execute this, I end up in the console with a 
different printer to what you're used to. This is still a data set with 1704 variables, sorry, 1704 rows and six columns. It's the exact same size. The data in there hasn't really been changed in each cell, but there is something interesting here. It says groups continent five. So there's five different continents. So the group by function has created five different groups. So that's information that's stored in this object. We haven't saved it as an object yet, but notice that it says here at the top a table. And a table is a data structure that's built on top of a data frame that can contain some more information, including the grouping information. That's not possible to save that in a data frame, but it's possible to save it in a table, which is why it was converted to a table when we grouped. The other thing that you can notice is the printout is a lot nicer than the default printout of a data frame. So a table will give you this a bit of color in your printer to make it more readable, will give you the types of data that you've got in each one of the variable, and it will make sure that it uses only the space that it's got in your console, so you don't have to scroll through a lot of data. So now that we've got this grouping information stored in the table, we can use that to do more interesting operations. So let's see an example. If we want to find the mean life expectancy for each continent in 2007. So across all countries, or across the countries in one single continent. Let's start with Gapminder. First, do a filter step. I'm going to go year has to be 2007. Then we can group by continent. And after this grouping operation, everything will happen on the group separately. So if I do now the same thing as before, summarize to get the mean LE, mean life expectancy, same formula as before. I can execute that and see the printout. I end up with a data frame with only five rows, one per continent. You can see that it has kept the continent variable here because it's a grouping variable. And here it's got a column for the mean life expectancy for each one of those continents. And it is all from 2007 because we filtered for 2007 beforehand. So you can see how you can use group by here to modify the behavior of the subsequent functions. Let's have a look at another little challenge. Let's see if we can find the max life expectancy for each country. The max life expectancy ever recorded in this data set for each country. So we can start with a new data set called max le, new object, and store something inside it. If you want to do this challenge, you can pause the video now, have a think about it, and try a couple of solutions. So it's very similar to what we did before. So to solve this challenge, we'll start with the dataset gapminder, pipe that into a group by function, where we group by country. We want to find something per, by country per, for, for each country, and pipe that into a summarize function, where max le is the new variable that contains the result of the operation max life exp. And this will be done on each country group. So we'll find out the max life expectancy for each one of those groups. So we've got a new object here called max le at the bottom. It's got only two variables and I can use the name max le to print it, 
to the console and there it is. So 142 rows, one for each country, but now you can see for each country the max life expectancy. Another thing you can do is add an extra step here. Again, pipe that into an arrange function and sort it per life expectancy. Oh, sorry, that doesn't exist anymore. We'll have to use the new name, max le. You can try and print it again, and now it starts with the bottom one. Okay, so this is pretty much it for today. Just wanted to show you an extra example, or a couple more extra examples, to maybe illustrate how useful it can be, with a different data set first. So I'm going to go uh, using Star Wars, which is a data set included in Dplyr, I believe. So if you use question mark Star Wars, you can see the help page. Here it is. There's a description of the data set. The help pages are not only for functions, you can also use them for data sets if they do have documentation. And it says that this data comes from Star Wars API. This is the name of the data set and it contains 13 variables and 87 rows. So name, height, mass for different um, characters in Star Wars, etc. So let's start with this example that I believe comes from the book uh, for data science, using the tidyverse mostly. So Star Wars will be piped into first a mutate function. Oh, sorry, not this one. Group by function, where we group by species. So we want groups for each different species that is included in this data set. And for each one of those, we're going to summarize two things. First, the n variable will contain the number of rows in each one of the group, and that's what the n function does. It counts the number of rows in each group, so it's the size of each group. You can use that to count. And the second is that the mass variable will contain the mean of the mass variable. So we're using the same name here, it, you won't throw an error, it can handle that. What we want to know is what is the average mass, the mean mass, for each one of those groups. Finally, we'll pipe that into a filter function, and that's where we use the n variable, because we want n to be bigger than 1, we only want groups that have more than one individual. So control enter to execute that. You see that we end up with lots of NAs, which are nicely colored in red because we're using a table. So if you want to work around this, remember the very common argument that exists for lots of functions in R. It's the na.rm argument. You can see it here, a logical value indicating whether NA values should be stripped before the computation proceeds. So you can use that in max, mean, sum, etc., etc. So we're going to set this one to true instead of the default false. And now it's going to ignore the NA values and return something for each one of the groups. So I'm executing it again. And there's our mean mass for each one of the groups. There's nine groups, including an NA group, when we don't know the species. And you can confirm in the N variable that all the groups have more than one individual. So that's one example. The other example that I want to show you is associating dplyr with ggplot2. So in one operation, going from data manipulation to data visualization. So I'll make sure that I load the package ggplot2. And here we're going to reuse our Gapmind dataset. So we start with Gapminder and also use the pipe operator. I'll pipe that into a filter in which continent has to be Europe because I only want to have a look at European countries 
And what I also want to do is that I'll group by year. and summarize where the sum of the population is stored as a sum variable. So I want to have a look at the total population of Europe for each year. And I can then pipe that into a ggplot function. And as you might remember, ggplot takes first where the data, or what data we're manipulating, what data we want to visualize, what is the data set? So we don't have to specify that because we're using the pipe operator. We can go straight to the aesthetic functions, function AES, where we specify that we want the x-axis to be associated to the year variable and the y-axis associated to the sum variable that we just created. We also have to define after a plus the geometry that we want to use in ggplot2, and this is the geom line. So if everything's typed right here, we end up with a graph of the increase in population between 1952 and 2007 for Europe. There we go. So if you're interested in more examples, there's a couple more in the online materi material that you can always access. I'm going to the website here that is linked in the video description. You can scroll through, through this and see a couple more examples where dplyr is used. There's another visualization here. So here we look at you using the same data set and associating again dplyr with ggplot. And we want to have a look at the top and bottom variations in life expectancy. So it's a bit more involved, but we end up with a visualization with the biggest difference in life expectancy in the data set and the smallest uh, differences. So another thing that you might want to have a look at is the compilation of resources that we've put together. All the way to the bottom of uh, the material you can follow this. It takes you to this list of links that's classified. Um, with some tutorials that we think are relevant. If you go to the top tutorial here, it's a book called R for Data Science. It's a free online book, it's a bit of a living resource. And you can go straight to cap chapter 5, Data Transformation, if you want to learn a bit more about dplyr. But it goes through the same essential verbs, but maybe more with more detail. So you can find again here, filter, arrange, select, mutate, and summarize, along with group by. Finally, there's a Tidyverse website if you're interested in the Tidyverse way to, to do things. Tidyverse is a bit of a dialect in the R language. And you can see dplyr here is listed as one of the main ones in this group of packages. And there's ggplot2. Redar to import data. Tibble is the data structure that's common to this group of packages. Tidy R is to tidy your data and per is to iterate. There's a lot of um, documentation here for each one of the packages. You can also install the core packages of the tidyverse with this command here. So hopefully you enjoyed this session. My name is Stefan for the Digital Scholars Hub at the UQ Library. Make sure you save your script before you close our studio. And if you've got everything in your uh, sorry, in your script to generate this data, you're safe to close our studio without saving your workspace. Cheers, bye.